Hi Bobcats! In this video we're going to take a look at uh, nuclear processes. These will involve first order kinetics, which is why we're introducing them here after chapter 14. And we're going to start by reviewing the nuclear isotope notation that hopefully you first saw in General Chemistry 1. Our objectives are to identify the various types of radiation and their associated particles, to write balanced equations for these nuclear decay processes and other nuclear reactions, and to calculate all of the first order kinetics type stuff, like the half-life, the initial amount, the final amount, or uh, the length of time uh, that has passed for a particular uh, process given all of the other variables. Remember to use this list of objectives as a checklist when you're getting ready for the test. So nuclear notation tends to look like one of these three forms. Um, you'll have the uh, lithium with a 7-3 out in front of it. You'll have lithium, the word written out, dash 7, or you'll have the 7-li uh, notation that's down at the very bottom. All of these refer to this isotope. And if you look closely at this nucleus, there are three protons protons and there are four neutrons. The protons are indicated with the plus sign and the neutrons are indicated with the zero because they are neutral, no charge. So when we're looking at this notation, the three refers to the number of protons. The number of protons also gives an element its identity. So saying three and saying Li is actually redundant because if we have three protons, it's lithium. If the element is lithium, we have three protons. That three is the number that you see on the periodic table, the atomic number that's used to order the elements in the periodic table. So sometimes this first notation gets shortened to what's down at the very bottom, which is the 7 without the 3 Li, because the 3 and the Li are redundant. That's also why when we use the form where it's the name is written out as a word, dash, and number, um, we're only given the 7, not the 3. Okay, so that 3 is the atomic number, it's the number of protons, so what in the world is the 7? The 7 is known as the mass number, and it is the total number of particles in the nucleus. So that's the sum of the protons plus the neutrons. So we have 1, 2, 3 protons, and 1, 2, 3, 4 neutrons, so 3 plus 4 gives us 7. Let's see what else we have here. Right, so that top number is known as the mass number. It's the total number of particles. That bottom number is the atomic number. It's only the number of protons. The nuclear charge is also another way of thinking about the atomic number since it's the number of protons. Radioactive decay takes place when a nucleus undergoes a reaction to form a new nucleus. This is always accompanied by the emission of a lot of radiation. So in this particular example, this nucleus, which isn't really specified, is emitting an alpha particle. An alpha particle consists of two protons and two neutrons. It's the same as the nucleus of a helium atom. There are a lot of particles that commonly appear in nuclear reactions, and you need to be familiar with what these particles are and their symbols. Um, the first of those is what we call the alpha particle, which we saw in the previous slide, which is a helium nucleus. So if we write out the nuclear symbol for it, it's a 4,2-He. Another particle that appears frequently is a beta particle, which is also known as an electron. And when we're writing nuclear processes, the symbol for an electron is a 0 minus 1 E. A gamma particle is actually um, a photon. It's a high energy photon, and its symbol is just gamma. A positron is a positively charged electron, and its symbol will be 0 plus 1 E. And then a neutron will have a symbol of 1, 0, N. All of these particles frequently appear in nuclear reactions, so it's really important that you can keep track of which one is which. Alpha decay is a process in which a 
nucleus emits an alpha particle. So in the example here is this 263 isotope of suborgium um, emits this alpha particle, right? So this alpha particle splits out of the nucleus. And then the other product here is whatever particles are left behind. When that alpha particle leaves, the nucleus loses two protons and two neutrons. And so all of the uh, particles that are left behind make up this rather fortium isotope. Beta decay happens when a nucleus emits a beta particle or an electron. And so over here on the product side, we're seeing that 0 minus 1 e. And um, something kind of interesting happens here. In in terms of this carbon-14 nucleus, one of the neutrons that's in that nucleus actually turns into a proton plus an electron. And so you'll notice that the number of protons increases by one. It goes from six to seven. And um, the total mass number, 14, remains the same. And so in beta decay, a neutron turns into a proton plus an electron. There's also a lot of energy given off in this process. Gamma decay occurs when um, a nucleus moves from one state to another state. It may not necessarily emit any other particles, just a, a gamma ray or a photon. Um, and additionally, many, many nuclear processes um, will release gamma particles. Um, a gamma doesn't have to be the only thing that's emitted. The three main types of radiation we'll encounter are alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. And this chart is summarizing the properties of these three types of radiation. The alpha uh, radiation is going to be uh, helium nuclei, the beta radiation is electrons, and the um, gamma radiation is photons. Uh, the thing that I really like you to focus on is this uh, relative penetrating power. This is an indication of how dangerous these different types of radiation can be. Uh, the gamma Gamma radiation will penetrate 10,000 times as deeply as alpha radiation. And so depending on what type of radiation you're dealing with, you have to take different measures to protect yourself from the radiation. Typically, alpha radiation will be stopped by something as thin as paper. Um, possibly even your clothing would be sufficient to protect you from alpha radiation. Beta radiation, on the other hand, will go right through something like paper, but it's typically stopped by something like wood. So if you're working in a lab that has a beta emitter in it and you wanted to protect yourself from any stray radiation, you could go down to Home Depot and buy some plywood, build yourself a box out of that plywood uh, to enclose your equipment, and you should be fairly well protected from that beta radiation. Gamma radiation, on the other hand, will blow right through paper, it'll blow right through wood. It will only be stopped by something extremely dense like lead or concrete. Uh, typically in lab, if you're working with gamma emitters, and it, it'd be the same thing for x-rays as well. X-rays have almost as much energy as gamma rays. Um, you're going to protect yourself from your equipment with lead bricks because the, the lead bricks are relatively easy to rearrange anytime you reconfigure your experimental apparatus. If you're working with some sort of a permanent installation, uh, the shielding will typically be built into the building itself. Like there may be a lead lined wall that um, when you're, you're working with the radioactive source, you would stand behind that radioactive wall. I'm sorry, you would stand behind that lead lined wall to protect yourself from the radiation.